Thanks for coming. You bet. Uh, when I, this was arranged, I was asked to kind of go through the IEP process. And typically, we provide trainings on IEP programming for uh, all of our educators in Kent ISD. And uh, it's, it's a full day training. So I'm going to try and get through <laughs> some of this in about an hour. Um, <laughs> so if you have questions as we're going through, I'm going I'm to briefly touch on a lot of these topics because I just don't, I won't have time to go in depth. So if you have any questions, please, you know, try to keep them, maybe write them down or whatever and ask at the end, and I'll be happy to to answer them. And if you have further questions, I'm always available um, via the email or via phone at Kent Intermediate School District. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the IEP, uh, the, a lot of the, these are all components of the IEP that, you're gonna, that you would see uh, teachers, parents, all the team members go through. Now you may be part of those teams um, as you're working with your students. So. Uh, this could be helpful for you as far as understanding what uh, is included in an individualized education program. Um, student profile and eligibility. Uh, this is all right on the first page of the IEP, pretty much which what we're going to do is get the student strengths, any parent concerns. Now these things can all be drafted ahead of time, so it doesn't have to necessarily be discussed there. It's ideal that the parent would provide um, input prior to the IEP meeting, so it's not a a uh, very lengthy process. They can. I was at one last night until eight o'clock at night, and it started at three forty-five. So um, they can be very long. <laughs> uh, it depends on on what the needs of the students are. So um, it always goes through the current evaluation, and then eligibility determination is done at the IEP meeting, not prior to. Even though there are evaluations that are done. Those are all just data points that did go into determining eligibility. The actual determination of eligibility happens at the IEP team meeting with input from all members. And that's been a, a little bit contentious. We really try to stay away, and we're probably going to do a little more training next year on what's called predetermination. And again, that decision is made by every member of the IEP team. Now, there is a final um, offer that is made by the district, uh, but there can be dissenting on uh, letters included, et cetera, if everybody doesn't agree with that determination. Again, I just talked about this a little bit, but <clears throat> you know, when you have your three-year re-evaluations, it's really, because it's determined at the IEP meeting, it doesn't go from evaluation to evaluation. It goes from IEP, that's when the 36 months start, and that's in IDEA as well as in the, the Marsh Rules of Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education. Uh, that it's a 36 month timeline, but it starts from that offer of FAPE or a free appropriate public education. If I speak in acronyms, stop me because we do speak in acronyms. So I'll try to explain that as we go through. Uh, transition, a lot of the students you're gonna work with, I'm sure, are getting to that transition age. Um, we recommend that uh, transition discussions start sometime in the you know teen years, and early teen years is preferable. Now. What the rule or the law says is that it doesn't have to be in effect, in effect until a student turns 16. So anytime there's a student that is 15 years old at an IEP, there has to be a discussion of transition because during the course of that annual IEP, they will turn 16, okay? So anytime a student is currently 15, there has to be a discussion of transition, and that means moving out into the real world. Um, so we recommend it, you know, in eighth grade and the whole, the transition activities are going to drive a lot of issues that occur in the IEP, i.e. Whether, whether or not the student is going to graduate with a diploma, is the student going to get a certificate of completion, what are the post-secondary goals, in other words, what are you looking for for that student to attain. It could be as, as little as being able to take care of themselves uh, you know, individually, independently, or it could be something where the student's planning on going to college, and we're getting more and more of that as we have, um, you know, like lower levels of, of ASD. Um, learning disabilities, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, who requires a transition? All public school students, all charter school students. Anybody who receives funding from the state and the federal government requires a transition IEP. Um, Non-public school students do not require a transition IEP. And that, of course you go through all the assessments. Now again, there's a number of different assessments that can be administered, but the idea is to find out what the student's desire is and then to uh, try to map that through the IEP process as to what goals and objectives you're gonna work on so that the student can be successful in what their desire is post-secondary or post-school uh, post age. In planning research, this is important. Students 
rights transferred to 18, regardless of their disability, at 18 to them, regardless of their disability, unless there are court, or court orders in place, okay? They have to be informed as well as the parent has to be informed. Could be a surrogate, whomever is serving as that parent at the time, has to be informed that their rights are going to transfer prior to them transferring, so at age 17, and after they've transferred at 18. And they have to be notified, the parent and the, and the student. The idea is that the parent may want to start some of those court proceedings. Uh, we've had students that, you know, this has not been started with. They're cognitively impaired and really can't make their own decisions educationally or even for what their, their course of study is going to be. So the parents really have to take that proactive mode in those students, especially with those students that have a more significant disability. Um, again, community agency involvement, okay? This is typically would possibly be Hope Network, but it's typically like Michigan Rehabilitative Services, MRS. Um, they have to be invited, but there has to be uh, permission. They have to gain permission from that parent in order to invite them, and this has to be done whenever there is a need that they are going to either pay for services or provide services for the students and, and after they're done with their education. Okay? So anytime there's a need, a lot of times we see that, you know, <laughs> this is unfortunate, but go through the IEP real quick and they say, oh, there's no need for this. Well, if they're going to, because it takes a little bit of extra time and effort to get these people at the table. So it's very important that, that anytime there's a question that we do get permission to invite. It doesn't mean they have to attend. It's that you're following or we're following our requirement for inviting the community agency. Um, again, the post-secondary vision and transition activities. These are the four areas. Again, stop me if I'm going too fast, but I want to get through all the slides. So, These are the four areas that have to be considered. It does not mean that they have to have goals and objectives with them, but those are the four areas that have to be considered for transition planning. And that would be whether or not there's training needs, education needs, employment needs, or independent living. Now, there have been... Um, there has been a lot of legal cases where they've been addressed that, that a lot of these were not considered. The last ruling came down that there's only a, a requirement that employment has to be um, addressed as well as education, but they can be addressed simultaneously. Okay, so there could be an employment and education goal or activity in that IEP, only one. And the requirement is that there's only has to be one. Now, that could look very different depending on the disability of the student. If a student's very high functioning and they want to go out and go to college, that you know their transition goal could very well be that they're going to improve their math skills so that they can be successful in college or improve their reading skills so that they can be successful in college. It doesn't mean that they have to be a separate goal for transition. It could be incorporated into their educational goals. Uh, the post-secondary vision starts the, the present level of functioning, uh, the PLAF statement. You'll see, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the IEPs and the way they look, but the PLAF statement um, is really where the whole IEP is driven from. There's, this is, if you think of it as a broad picture, there's three components. There's data, there's the evaluation data, the assessment data that drives the PLAF statement. What are the needs of the student? What are the present levels and what are their academic needs? Which then drives the goals and objectives and the activities that are Put into the IEP itself. So very important that transition when it gets to the, when the students get to be this age, this is going to drive the plan because that's really what you're looking to address is what are they going to do currently and in the future. Um, interests are areas where <laughs> excuse me, a student has a skill or wants to gain a skill and preferences are what the student would choose. Now we have to be realistic with this and I've worked with students before that are you know, have a, and, and this is, you know, IQ of 50, and their interest is they want to be a veterinarian, okay? I've seen IEPs that have said, student wants to be a vet. Well, the chances of that occurring are probably slim and none with a, a cognitive impairment such as that. So it's very important that teams or members that deal with the child are realistic with them and say, oh, that's wonderful. We love that the fact that you want to deal with animals, and that's obviously what is driving you. Have you thought about looking into, um, you know, caring for animals, look, looking at a zoo employment or something along those lines so that you're not, we don't want to say, oh, you're never going to do that, kid, but 
On the other hand, we kind of know that you know veterinary school is <laughs> probably one of the hardest schools to get into post-secondary. A student with a 50 IQ who's not passing classes, who's on a certificate of completion class, is not going to be able to get into veterinary school. So it's very important that we're very realistic with the students and the parents, you know. And it's, and it's a tricky conversation. Transition itself is tricky. It is very difficult. It's a very difficult conversation to have with a parent. Um, everybody, nobody expects that when, when that child is, is in the belly that, that you know, there's going to be something that may not be 100% perfect. Well, when you get to the point where you start talking about whether or not uh, the student's going to go on to get a high school diploma or the student's going to get a certificate of completion and maybe have just some training needs or not, that's a very difficult conversation to have with parents. And it's probably the most tricky with uh, special education students that the conversation with the parents is that about that time when you start talking about what are we going to do for life. And it kind of really hits home and it's, it's very, it's important because it has to be in place and then we have to have activities that drive the educational program forward that's going to best fit the needs of the student and if we sugarcoat it the whole time we're not doing that. And I know that it's, you know, we have a lot of parents, and, and by all means we should always err on the side of getting a diploma, however, sometimes it's not realistic. So. Just a, a heads up, that's probably one of the trickier conversations to have. Um, always have, obtain the answers to the questions prior to the IEP team meeting. Again, draft everything that you possibly can, but you can't predetermine. Um, at least one measurable annual goal must be identified that's aligned with the post-secondary vision. Now, we talked about that a little bit earlier. They should always address education and employment. Well, uh, again, that's going to vary greatly depending on what the course of study is for the student. And uh, there must be the transition activities developed to move the student toward the post-secondary vision. And you should always address all areas that will reduce barriers that the student may have. Uh, students' course of study, um, again, again, is always address the transition IEP, the date of graduation, the course of study. And that's a trick. That's that tricky one. It's a diploma, certificate of completion, career readiness certificate, certificate of attendance. Um, a lot of kids stay until they're 26. You know, they just age out, but we still want to address what they're going to be working on during those times. And then how the study supports their vision. Okay, this is what we talked about earlier, the plat. It used to be a plat, it was a present level of educational performance, it was a number of different acronyms, and now it's a present level of academic achievement and functional performance, it's an awful acronym. And so, it, it's, I had a guy rec record a video for us on the plat. And uh, he, he refused to say it. <laughs> he's like, that, I can't say plat. That's ridiculous. So, um, but it is what it is. And, <laughs> excuse me. You always um, refer to the Common Core State Standards if the student is in that type of study. Um, the only time they would not be is if they're very low functioning students with cognitive impairments or low functioning autistic spectrum disorder or severely multiply impaired students. Those would be functional and adaptive needs. Other than that, we should always look at the Common Core State Standards or GLCEs, whatever we're using now, recent le uh, legislation, we're not quite sure, but um, it, we've been preparing for the Common Core State Standards. Data sources, the educational need, very important, the starting point for instruction. PLAF should pass um, a test, and that means you should be able to walk into any convenience store, any hospital and hand a plath to a person and say, can you tell me where the student, we should start instruction with the student? And anybody without educational knowledge should say, yep, I know. This is what the student needs, this is where he's deficit, and this is where I start. Now, it also shouldn't be 18 pages long. I've seen those too where there's a 12 page plath and you're reading it and it's, I mean, you, you get lost in it. So they should, if you think about this, they should be parent friendly in, all, in almost all cases. And it should be easily read. Um, We'll kind of get through this. I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Again, there are academic areas addressed in the plan, and this is why it says functional performance as well. There are functional areas that may be self-care, social skills, behavior, or adaptive functioning. Now, there has to be adaptive uh, functioning addressed for all students with cognitive impairments. The purpose of the plan is to identify First of all, the foundation, it's the foundation which the rest of the IEP is built on. Uh, the impact of the disability on involvement and progressing in the general curriculum. And each area in the plat must be addressed in at least one of the following areas. So if there's an area of need identified in the plat, okay, student is, has a deficit in math, 
There either has to be a goal, a service, or an accommodation in that area that's addressed in the plan. So when you get, like we talked about those 12 page plans, they also come with 13 pages of goals because every area that's addressed in there has to be addressed in one of these three ways. Is that feasible to accomplish in a year typically? No. And that's the whole thing is we can get sometimes carried away based on parents' wants and needs and don't really think what's gonna be best for the student. And parents do are becoming more and more educated and come in and say, well, this, this is, these are my rights to what, yes it is, but there's also the right of the district to say, or the whoever is operating the district to say, this is our offer to you, what we can feasibly achieve in the course of the year. There are four elements of a plan, and every plan must include these four elements. Again, there's baseline data for each area of need, okay? Now again, just because we have a, a somewhat of a, a lower functioning area does not mean it's a area of need that can be accomplished in the course of an annual IEP. A description of the starting point for instruction, the areas of educational need, and the impact statement. In other words, how the disability affects the student's involvement and progress in the general education curriculum, and achieving their goals and objectives. Okay, baseline data could be tests, it could be classroom performance, it could be observation, it could, and it can be provided by nearly anyone who works with the student. It does not have to be all educationally relevant material. If there are outside diagnoses, those should be taken into consideration. It doesn't always mean they're going to transfer over into an educational diagnosis because, again, we're um, in the mission of educating, and we have to really focus on the, the educational components and not as much on the clinical components. However, most times they, they will rear themselves in the educational arena as well. But it's not always. Um, you know, I, we get that a lot with, with students who have um, been diagnosed with emotional issues or maybe high level ASD where the parents, you know, and, and rightfully so, they are clinically diagnosed as such, but if there's no educational impact, there was a student that was diagnosed um, with a high level of, of, this is old because we're not gonna do this anymore, but Asperger's, and uh, the parent came in and said, well, we want an IEP, and we said, well, absolutely, you can request an evaluation, that's your right as a, as a parent. Uh, but it appears to me as though the, the student's 100% proficient on the MEEP test, they've not had any behavioral issues, there are no social issues reported, and they're getting all A's in middle school. I don't see how the disability is affecting the student. Now, we pushed through the evaluation, the student didn't qualify. This one was a lengthy, contentious issue. Um, and it went actually to an ALJ, uh, to an administrative law judge, and he sided with the district and said there is absolutely no educational impact that for this student because of the data that's shown. And yes, we agree that there is a, a diagnosis of this clinical disorder, however, it did not appear or did not show itself in the educational setting. So, okay. Um, again, baseline data can be from many, many different sources. Starting point for instruction. Decide the target skills with enough detail to give a starting point for instruction. Provide frequency and location data. Um, and that means, you know, how, <laughs> where is it going to take place, how long is it needed for, et cetera. Uh, give a detailed description of the student needs. The student needs are important because we need to make sure that we're, everything that we do in the IEP is addressing those student needs specifically. And we'll talk about goals a little bit. Now, this was recently uh, changed. It was actually in the uh, rules package from October of 2011. Districts really didn't start implementing until the beginning of this year, but <coughs> in the state of Michigan, we used to write goals and objectives that, well, first of all, in IDEA, there is no requirement for objectives unless the student has functional deficits, which would mean low functioning cognitive impairment or ASD. There's no requirement for objectives or short-term benchmarks. In Michigan, we always did that because we thought it was you know, really meeting the needs of the goal. So we would typically write a goal that was very broad, uh, improve reading skills. And then we'd write detailed objectives that would say, you know, Johnny is going to work on CVC e-words, improve reading fluency, and um, work on prefixes and suffixes, with the idea that it was going to improve his reading skills. While the federal government came in and monitored the state and said, we love this, and this is very detailed, and that's great. However, 
can you be sure that by CVCE words and prefixes and suffixes that Johnny's going to actually improve his reading skills? And how do you know? Well, you don't because we never measured the actual goal. So the federal government said, Michigan, you have to now have all of your annual goals measurable, not just the objectives measurable. So there's been a change, and you'll start seeing this in IEPs. You're going to see something that looks like this. By June 2014, Johnny will do this skill as measured by this and documented by this. So there's no question whether or not that goal has been achieved. Now, we still have the requirement in our Michigan rules that says that we have to have short-term objectives and or benchmarks. Okay? So that's still being uh, looked at. There's going to be a new Michigan rules package that probably comes out in the fall. We're hoping fall, maybe winter. And the idea is that they're probably going to remove the requirement for objectives since we're writing all the goals as measurable. So stay tuned. Um, again, critical components of a goal, meaning for measurable, able to be monitored, aligns with the plan, and it may align with the grade level content standards depending on what, where the student is functioning. This is what a measurable goal looks like. And this is actually a model that the Michigan Department of Education provided for educators. And basically, it kind of follows that same mold that I just told you. But it's, uh, you know, by this date, the student will do this skill when and under this condition as measured by this. And that's what all the goals should be looking like now. And this could be for any number of areas that the student is working in. And it's also social emotional goals, behavioral goals. Um, functional goals, adaptive goals, so it's not just those academic goals. It's probably easier to write this in this way for academic goals than it is for social emotional goals in those, some of those other areas. Progress reports. Um, it's recommended that reporting on goals and objectives go home with a typical report card cycle. Um, and must report on all the goals, benchmarks, or objectives and ensure that reporting is accessible upon demand. And that's important. I'm the compliance monitor for Kent County. When we go in and I work with, typically with monitors from the state, or I do it by myself sometimes, but we look at, there's a lot of data that, that, that may not be kept up to date and accessible upon demand. And one of the things I ask for when there's a state complaint filed or um, there's a compliance issue is show me the data, show me the law, show me the um, accommodations that you've been providing the student that's written in the IEP. And a lot of times there's not documentation for that. And that's a, that's a problem. So make sure that everything that's being done, and, and if you're part of that, <laughs> well, it's very important that you document everything that you do. Uh, benchmarks and objectives, again, they're kind of just short-term steps toward achieving the goal. And we used to really focus on them. Now we've, um, I mean, they're still, they're still a requirement, uh, but they can be written, as long as the goal is written as measurable, you can use what are called benchmarks as opposed to separate skills. Separate skills would be objectives, but benchmarks would be time-limited steps toward achieving the goal. So if you're going to re require the goal be achieved at 80% in the current, as identified in the plat, the student is currently functioning in that area at 40%, it could look like this. By, if I'm writing by next June, it could look like this. By October, he's going to increase to 50. By January, he's going to increase to 60. Uh, by March, he's going to increase to 70. And then by June, he'll complete the goal. Evaluation procedures are what you actually are going to do to collect the progress. Performance criteria is you know, how, how you evaluate the measurable goals and benchmarks. Consider the target rate or frequency. In other words, 80%, four out of five times, et cetera. And then the schedule of, of evaluation is different than the evaluation procedures and the, the criteria because it's really how often you're going to measure prog progress. Now, I said earlier that you have to report progress at minimally at the same time as report cards, but you have to measure progress much more frequently than you would reporting it. You know, typically we measure progress weekly, bi-weekly, monthly in certain situations. That's about as long as you go. And that's really just determining whether or not what's been written as a goal is actually, uh, we're actually moving toward reaching that goal. So uh, the idea is you have a target, your annual goal, you instruct or provide service, measure. If it's not successful, change what we're doing <laughs> toward reaching that goal. A lot of times you'll see goals written the same thing year after year after year. And I, I question, well, if it didn't work one year, why do you think it's going to work the next year? 
And you know, so we need to really do a good job of assessing data. Uh, again, we talked about that, but it should really be ongoing. Data collection should be. If, 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 if there are services being provided to a student frequently, the more frequently the services are provided, the instruction is provided, the more frequently the data should be collected. And who can collect data? Anybody that works with the, with the student. Anybody that works with the student. Now, it could be that a special education provider is, has designed a method for collection and would ask someone else to collect that data. Okay, so that's feasible. Uh, because, you know, that the provider, if they're coming in once a month, they need data more than that. They can't tell if what they're doing is going to work unless they have that data to back it up. So, um, other components of the IEP. Special factors, supplementary aids and services. Um, always consider what, what are needed for special factors, i.e. positive behavioral intervention, support. Record supplementary aids and program modifications. Include frequency and timeline location. We get a lot of this, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a recipe for failure. Um, and we don't, I, I haven't seen it much recently, but that's a recipe for failure. Because if you're going to write an accommodation in an IEP for a student, it's determined by the IEP team, team that that student needs that accommodation. Well, <laughs> if the student is the one that's going to be asked to provide the need or the, I need it now or I don't need it now, what if they don't ask all year? Did they really need the accommodation? Well, the IEP team said yes. But if we write in that it's by student request or teacher discretion, it doesn't work. So when you write that in, that's why there should be frequency and timeline. In other words, how often, if there's an accommodation or a supplementary aid, when do they need it and in what circumstances do they need it? If they don't need it, don't write it in the IEP. <laughs> and that's another thing we get into with accommodations and, and you know a list of 20 accommodations for a general education teacher that's got 35 kids in the classroom. Well, is that realistic? Probably not. If the student needs more support than they can get in the general education classroom, then that's a program change, not more accommodations in the classroom. So that's a, that's a, that's a tricky one right there. I've seen IEPs that do that literally have 20 to 25 accommodations. It's, un, it's impossible to provide those during the course of a school day, and it's not benefiting the student. And then it's, a, a, it's required that that all be documented every time those are provided. So every time that's provided, if you're recording on 25 accommodations, I mean, that doesn't require, it doesn't allow you any other time to do anything else. Um, accommodations are what the student would benefit from but what she, she requires to progress the general curriculum and, what, and work toward attainment of the goals. Um, accommodations should level the playing field but not give the student an unfair advantage. Who determines them? Gen ed teachers, providers, special ed teachers, depends on the, on the, the situation the student is in. If a student's going to go into general education classes, um, really that teacher should, let, it should be a strong part of what's being provided for accommodations. Uh, documentation, again, we talked about that. You have to document, there's two requirements for document accommodations. When it occurred, so date, time, etc., and then what was the result of the accommodation. So if it's extended time on tests, you would have to say it was provided on this date for this test and student achieved 70%. That's just a measure of whether or not the accommodation is successful or not. Programs and services. Before determining the program and the amount of time, ask the question, when the student's performance level does not match that of their peer group, are there goals and objectives that require specialized instruction that can't be taught within a general setting? Specialized instruction that cannot be taught within a general setting. And they're determined based on the student needs, the goals, and short-term objectives. And we determine um, a departmentalized program. I don't think you have to worry about that. And then calculate the frequency of related services by minutes and sessions. It's not included in the program FTE or full time equivalent. Um, address the setting within the location, in other words, where the programs will be located, and then start and end date if it's different from the IEP. Now, that may be something that you guys run into because of the start and end date may, may vary depending on the student's 
um, needs in the program and what type of services are being provided by, I think it's Kentwood still for the most part in the residential settings, but I'm not mistaken. Um, related services, there's either direct service and there's consultative service, and those are, they work with the student, um, they're related to goals and objectives, and the student is, is on the, that provider's caseload. Consultation means that you're providing, the provider observes informally, assesses or works with the student, and provides consult to the professional, the parent, could be the case manager, could be a therapist, etc. So that's typically what, what that's about for consultation. Now monitoring, um, there is no goals and objectives, they're not on the caseload of the provider, and it's really, I don't even like <coughs> monitoring personally, however, <laughs> Um, it's really typically used when a student is um, gradually being removed from a service. So if there's now no longer a need, as determined by the IEP team, that the student really needs that direct social work service that they've been getting, there still may be, we don't want the student to fall off and go back to needing it. So there may be some monitoring that occurs just to make sure that they're still doing what they need to be doing. Transportation. Um, it's kind of a tricky one. Special education and transportation, when you see that on an IEP, the student, you can always see this student requires specialized transportation. If the answer is yes, that means that student is on a bus and transported with only special education students. And that was a little bit of a bone of contention too. We had a situation arise, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago, and it was a different ISD, but the district bought a lift bus. And they said, well, this is great, so we're going to transport our own students as opposed to using the ISD transportation, and we're going we're to buy a lift bus for these students that are in wheelchairs, and we can even have all general education students ride the bus. Well, and that one student that had the wheelchair in his IEP said he required specialized transportation. The district said, well, this is specialized. Look, we have a lift bus. And, and, and they were found to be out of compliance, and they had to um, <coughs> provide additional transportation for just one student on a bus to and from every day, quite costly. It costs about $60,000 a year to do that for one student. Um, again, a bus that has general education, regular education student is not considered specialized transportation. You determine the need for specialized transportation, it's not, it's not automatic. There has to be a need that's, that, that's present for specialized transportation. Um, you know, there, there's reason for needing special education transportation, and it has its implications. No means the students can walk or use general education transportation to get to and from school. If there are no problems on the bus, and this used to be just a, a, a commonplace thing. Every time a student was special education, we wrote, yep, special transportation. Well, if a student doesn't need it, this is, they, they should not be hindered to work with their, or to be with their peers up during that time because they're, they have a, a label. If they can use the general education, then by all means should use general education. If you write yes, it means a special education program or service is located away from the student's regular attendance area, i.e. could be a regional program, could be a center-based program, could be a residential program. The student has medical, health, developmental, and or behavioral needs that cause him or her to require transportation, special transportation. Um, the medical, health, developmental are pretty self-explanatory. Behavioral sometimes become tricky. And a student who uses general transportation to and from school may need special transportation to and from CBI sites, um, community-based instruction, when they're going out into the community. So that could be an option as well. There are three tip types of specialized transportation. There's curb to curb, which typically is bus stop. <laughs> uh, there's corner to corner and door to door. We used to write a lot of door to door. <clears throat> it has to be a very special case that, that requires a door to door type of transportation because it typically requires a special bus a lot of times too. Not all those very large yellow buses can get into everyone's driveways or cul-de-sacs or dirt roads or, so it's a pretty specialized case when you really write in door to door for a student. And then extended school year services. Um, 
ESY is something that sometimes gets un overlooked. And ESY is obviously the extent of school year services. It is a requirement that for every student that requires specialized instruction, that extended school year services be addressed. Okay? That means that they may require additional service throughout what is atypical for a normal school district, i.e. today there's a lot of kids last day of school. <laughs> While some kids may still need school during the summertime for a couple of different reasons, and I'll get to that in just a second. Special alternative to school year refers to special education related services that are provided to a child with a disability beyond the normal school year. <coughs> Excuse me. Each public agency has to ensure that extended school year services are available, and extended school year services must be provided only if the child's IEP determines on an individual basis the services are needed for the provision of FAPE. FAPE, again, is, is, this is a very common term in special education, free, appropriate public education. It's what the uh, initial um, act that was developed in 1975 94 142 was based on was a free appropriate <laughs> public education for all students there must be at least one current IEP goal where significant concerns exist regarding skill maintenance during a break of service these are the three areas that you have to consider when determining whether or not a student needs extended school year services okay Goal areas of concern should represent skills essential to the progress of a student, and ESI, ESY services must be based on data to determine which of any goals represent areas of concern that may present significant difficulties in maintaining skills during service breaks. The law says that these are the three situations under which students may require extended school years. Um, a student may have a serious potential for regression of skills, that cannot be recuperated. The nature or severity of the disability could be such that they require it, or there could be a critical stage or area of learning that may be needed to be developed. Okay. Um, I went through it quite quickly, so uh, I want to make sure, does anybody have any questions that I can answer regarding service or anything in the area of special education? Again, my, um, I've been doing this for about 22 years now and probably have seen it all. So, yes? Um, is every student that is on an IEP, would they qualify for a certificate of completion or is there a certain level of accommodations that they can still get a, a graduate degree for? A, a diploma? Yeah, yeah. Diploma. That, that's determined during those transition IEPs typically and that's what we call a course of study. Um, there are some, some other means that can be used to offer them a diploma. Uh, there could be, in some cases, a modified, a slightly modified curriculum, or there could be what's now called a personal curriculum that was identified a couple of years ago where a student with a disability can qualify for some modifications to what the expectations are. What we have in the state of Michigan is called the Michigan Merit Curriculum for high school grades. And for that Michigan Merit Curriculum, it's quite extensive to be able to earn a diploma. Um, there are a minimum of uh, 22 credits in most districts around here that they have to acquire before they're awarded a diploma. And they have to be at a certain level of competency in order to get those credits. So what a personal curriculum can do to still offer a diploma would be to either modify the number of benchmarks that they would have to acquire. In other words, if there are 70 benchmarks or objectives that they would have to get through to get Algebra 1 credit, it could be that they would only have to get 40 of them proficient. It could lower the level of proficiency that they have to work at. In other words, if every other student is expected to get 70% for passing grade, they could work at 60% proficiency, or it could do a combination of both. But typically, to answer your question kind of broadly, typically those um, decisions are made based on data, based on educational achievement to the point, to that point, and you know, a lot of times based on the disability if it's a severe disability and what the potential for acquiring knowledge is. So, no, not all kids get a certificate of completion. It depends on the level. And we, like I say, in all cases, we really should err on the side of a diploma until you determine that it's not feasible for the student. Now, again, you don't want to get to the point where the student's so frustrated and they can't make any progress in the general curriculum 
um, and they're not getting any benefit out of what they're learning. Because a lot of times you get, you know, you have a kid sitting in a classroom. If they're not getting benefit from that, and it's going over their head. There, are, there's a better way to spend their time that could be preparing them for a job or something along those lines. Any other questions regarding anything in special education? I have one. Yeah. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how the this process applies to um, gaining access, particularly to uh, contained classrooms and special education facilities at the older level, things like Lincoln, but also Ken O'Shea and early childhood special education? Okay. I get so yeah, so how, the, how the IEP process relates to how kids get into or access okay. these kinds of schools? Yeah, absolutely. Um, typically, we always, uh, you know, obviously, typically we always try to start in a, a least restrictive environment. Um, it's called an LRE, and it is a requirement of law. So we always try to start in, a mo in the least restrictive environment. The least restrictive environment is general education with no accommodations, okay? Um, a lot of that is based on their ability to progress in the general education setting. Now, that, some of these children are, are identified as early as a year as needing special education services. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the level or severity of those, the, the disabilities, it may be determined that the program that fits them not be in a general setting. The majority of students are serviced in general education settings. Matter of fact, like 80% are. Um, some students that require, obviously, physical, they have physical impairments, that would be like a Lincoln campus. Those are, those, they have staff that is more appropriate for students that have those multiple impairments. The IEP determines whether or not those students are going to be placed in, and there's a, a continuum of services. Let me kind of go back to this. The continuum of services for LRE would be your general education, general education with support, self-contained or categorical programming in a school district. In other words, a student is in a special classroom for students with cognitive impairments because they're not able to progress in the general curriculum. Then there are what are called regional programs where the students have been in those categorical programs in the districts and still have not seen successes. So the IEP team determines that they need a regional program, which is even a little bit more severe um, of, of disability. And then there are what are called center-based programs, i.e. Lincoln, KDCs, um, Ken O'Shea's, those types of programs are what are called center-based programs, and those are for the most severe students in the county that are referred. Now, the only one that has a, <clears throat> they, they all have referral processes, okay? So what you would do is typically go through the referral process first, you would gain acceptance, and then go to an IEP team meeting. Oh, okay. The district at the IEP team meeting has a responsibility of offering that faith, which I talked about, through an IEP. So if the student has been accepted and you go to the IEP team meeting and it's determined you know, that, that that's what the student needs, the district's responsibility is to say, okay, here's our offer. Now the parent goes, no, I have to agree with that. And sometimes they don't. Um, they have due process rights after that fact. And that's a lot of times where I come in um, and explaining their rights to them and, and what they can do. There could be a state complaint filed, et cetera. So, but it's really an IEP team decision that really places a student in a program, but it has to be data-based. In other words, they've had to have shown failure previously, unless they're very, very, and again, there are five to 10% of students that are, are or 5% of special education that are very severely impaired that go straight into center programming initially, right off the bat. So Where those are those are more of the Lincoln campus kids. Right. Those have the, the, the physical, yeah. Where do programs like the school that we have on site that Uh, kind of off of it a little bit <laughs> because, they're, because they're placed there for typically other reasons, not educational reasons. So, but we're still required to provide educational services to the students while they're in the residential setting. So um, that's very, I would say, probably one of the most restrictive. So if you want to look at it, it's probably right next to center base, but not really in that continuum because it's not an educational facility. But yeah, it's very, usually very, um, low on the level of LRE. So right. all the way down to the bottom of, of those, that continual services from general education to center-based programs. Some of the center-based programming is very costly. Um, right. We had three students that were at the Michigan School for the Deaf in the past, now we're down to one now, but that typically runs about $75,000 to $100,000 a year for one student. 
Now remember, the districts only get seven thousand dollars for that student. So. Yeah, it kind of related to that. I've yeah. been reading nationally that the number of students that are receiving IEP-based services has been trending up over time. Is that a local trend as well? Uh, not typically. In, actually, we in Kent County actually are kind of a little bit different than the whole state or the na na nation in general. We're seeing a huge increase, not so much in Kent as we have around the state or the country in, in um, diagnosis of ASD right. or autism spectrum disorder. Uh, I think that may be some of the rationale for the trending up mm. of students with disabilities because now I think we're at one in 55 students is born that, that is born currently is diagnosed with ASD. So the levels have gone just through the, through the roof with that. Um, we have not trended upward in Kent County. Um, mm. we're, we've, been, we've maintained the, the, the current percentage of around 12.5%. Um, mm. Any other questions? Yes. Um. For extended school year, I just want to make sure I understand it right. Yep. So for extended school year, it really is a joint decision between the current educator and maybe the family and other parties involved whether they get those services or not? It's an IEP team decision. The IEP team consists of typically a general education teacher, special education provider, evaluation team representative, mm -hmm. um, a parent, and any other um, parties that are familiar with the student. Now, the other parties have to be invited, and uh, either side can invite who they choose to invite as long as it's done so ahead of time. So, so it that, should be done in a meeting? Yes. An IEP meeting? It should be, or an amendment, yes. It doesn't have to be a full meeting. It could be done through what's called an amendment or an addendum, but there has to be notification provided that that's been decided. And what would you do if you didn't agree with the decision regarding extended school? Who didn't agree on that? <laughs> it's going to depend were, on who. Like, we often, I guess, act as custodial parents in a sense, or advocates for the guardians for kids. Advocates, that's better. Yeah, advocates. <laughs> um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes we might not agree if they are, they, they don't need services, mm -hmm. or they just, um, yeah, without any meeting happening or anything, really. There's like, you don't need to go. Right. The, the people that can disagree are the required members of the IEP team mm -hmm. or the, the parents. So in that role, it would have to be the parent that would disagree, and then they have due process rights. So who would the parent contact then? You. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. For Kentwood as well? For all Kent Anybody County? Anybody in Kent County, they can contact me, and I can yeah, explain Yeah, we know that. that. I mean, we tell the parents all the time, you have to be the one really to say They do, something. because yeah. they have the guardianship of the, whoever the parent is. It could be a surrogate. I mean, whoever that guardian is at the IEP has that right to disagree. Now, again, it's the district's offer, though, to that until they go through their due process rights and there's a, there's a change made. Oh, I have a question. Okay, so you said surrogate. <laughs> Sorry, I'm the director of the DART program, so I have many, many thoughts about everything from the university. Okay. So if a parent wanted to name us as a surrogate, they can't do that? Nope. Or how? Nope. If the parent... Does surrogate come from the school, yeah? Surrogates, I just did a training. As soon as surrogate parent trained, surrogates are appointed in four situations where the parents can't be located when they're a ward of the state. Um, when the, um, the parents are, are no longer in the picture <laughs> or whether they're uh, homeless through McKinney Bento. So that's really the only time that surrogates are appointed and that's the responsibility of the districts to appoint those surrogates. Mm -hmm. I worked with um, Amy Cyrus of DHS and she helped me identify a pool of people that we trained for Kent County for surrogates. So if there's a need for a surrogate, you can contact me and I can get you to hopefully get you one. So, so for court-warded kids, the Guard, the guardian, the DHS person, is not automatically the surrogate. You actually represent a different person who's sort of the like DHS a guardian. DHS person is very rarely the okay. parental contact. Yeah. Typically, there'll be an identified guardian for educational purposes. It's when you said court, that's different than state. Right. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not the legal guy. That's okay, but if they're a ward of the court, the court has been involved in it and will appoint, typically, a person for okay. educational um, decision-making for the student. That goes right to that court order. Okay. So you would look right on there and say, this person has custodial rights to that parent. That's the one that can make those decisions. Wards of the state, on the other hand, when they're in temporary foster care or something along those lines, it's a little different. Now, if it's a permanent foster parent, parent that's a parent. <laughs> so that, that person makes those, those decisions in that case. But, but temporary wards, if their parents are still involved, those parents have rights. As long as there's not a court order that says they don't have rights. Okay. okay. So... 
Until there's something that says they do not have rights educationally, the biological parents are always, they always have educational rights. I'll give you an example. This, this happens a lot. Divorced. Okay? Mom says, I want this. Gets an IEP started. I want, I want my kid evaluated for special education. Okay? Dad says, uh-uh. I revoke the evaluation. Who gets to go for it? Who has the right? They both do. Because neither have been terminated educationally from having rights for those students. It's one of those situations where there's a no-win situation. You get mom and dad in the same room and say, look, let's do what's best for the student. Because <laughs> what you're doing here is not helping that kid at all. So that, it's a tricky situation. And again, always goes back to biological parents unless there is an order that says they no longer have guardianship or custodial rights. Kind of in a different direction yep. for our young kids in particular, but for some of our older kids also. Um, we have kids whose condition is rapidly evolving, like like the particularly the preschoolers who are in autism services. Yep. They may go from not talking and having functional skills to being ahead academically of their peers yep. in 12 months or 18 months. How does the system respond to significant changes in kids' functional status or need, educational needs. Hopefully they're collecting data frequently like we mm -hmm. talked about and they can assess where that student is currently functioning. There's always the right of the parent or guardian also to request a new IEP or request a new programming. There's also every year can, you know, now doesn't have to be, less than a year does not have to be agreed upon, but you can also request new evaluations. You know, they may, I mean, the student may not qualify anymore. We don't want... We, it's to your benefit if kids don't need highly restrictive services. Absolutely. Right? As it's well to the benefit the of the kids. It's to the benefit yeah. of the parents, the benefit of the community, and the benefit of society. <laughs> the left, the fewer, and, that, and that's one of the things that we've, we've struggled with is as soon as this, the, people think they're really getting this extra help for students, and it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it hinders students to have IEPs. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we've curricularly impaired students in the past. Yeah. Okay, and I, what I mean by that is, um, and, and I... I was a, uh, guilty of this when I was a young teacher. A student would have a learning disability in reading. So I would walk down the hallway and I'd grab Johnny and Alyssa and we'd walk down to my room and I would teach them reading at a much lower level. Well, what class do you think I pulled them out of? Reading. Reading. Okay. So now their peers are continuing to grow at their reading. They're getting taught way down here. Do you think they ever catch up and narrow the gap? No. The gap grows, and it continues to grow and continues to grow. Now, hopefully we don't do that much anymore because we've learned that that's not working and we're keeping kids in. I'll give you a statistic, and I, and I don't have the exact numbers, but since 1975, when we started having, uh, required to provide IEPs to students for individualized education plans, the idea has been, especially for the higher functioning students, that we would provide interventions, we would narrow the gap, and get them back into the general education setting. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea behind special education setting. How successful do you think we've been since 1975? All the kids in the country who've ever had an IEP. What percent goes back into general ed before they either graduate, age out, or no longer require special education services? What percentage do you think goes back into general ed and graduates and does a regular thing? Ten. Anybody else got? One. About three. Okay. And now you've got to think about this. We have how many kids that have speech-only IEPs? because they have a list for a, a rolling R or a, I mean, literally, that can be pretty well fixed, articulation. How many of those kids have a, a lot? And those are included in that statistic. So, just didn't do a good job in the past. We want to we wanna look now more at prevention rather than reaction. <laughs> we want to put programs in place that are going to prevent kids from getting identified as needing special <laughs> services rather than waiting until they need them and then saying, okay, well, let's give you the services. And by that time, it's typically too late, but yeah. So how, how can you do that if you were saying earlier that you need to have the data showing that the child is not successful in their general environment or typical environment right. before they get those kind of services? Absolutely, because you, you extend all every, every possible intervention that you can extend first before they go to an IEP. So you, collect, you teach, you analyze, you collect the data, you, you change your instruction, you teach, you collect the data, you change your instruction, everything that you can possibly do before they're identified as needing an IEP, you want to extend all of the, expend all of those first before they're actually identified. Because again, 
Typically, once a student's identified as an IEP, they have an IEP for life. Is that what's called RTI, or Response yep. to Intervention? And I'll give you a new okay. terminology. It's going to be another acronym, but it's MTSS, um, and, and we're expanding on that. It's a national terminology. RTI is Response to Intervention. It had a very much a reading connotation to it. <laughs> now, MTSS is expanding. Um, we're incorporating, and I, I oversee the program at Kent ISD for MTSS as well, but it is uh, multi-tiered systems of support. And what they are is behavior, reading, and now math also. So there could be systems and uh, there are structures basically under which you fall under. And that's what you do during RTI or MTSS is identify kids with learning needs. You, you monitor their needs, okay, and really identify specific areas where they're lacking. Hit those areas hard on top of what they're getting in the general curriculum and the idea that we're going to catch them up and get them back on track before they get too far behind and need special education services. That's the idea behind that along those lines, I, I work with teachers from all over the place, and the ones that have had any kind of background in universal design for instruction, or have been through the START training, and yep. just understand autism at a deeper level, yep. they have so many more tricks up their sleeve yep. that they can use in a genetic classroom that many of those kids don't require yep. anything extra. <laughs> but picking and choosing those teachers, and some families get lucky and some yep. families don't, and then it's really hard on an outpatient side to know what's available in that school because I don't know those teachers and I don't know what's actually provided in that model. So the more we can standardize that, the better. December 3rd, <laughs> next year we've got an all-day training. Kelly Dunlop's coming to do a training um, for general education teachers Wonderful. and providing uh, supports for students with autism in the general education setting. So yeah. it's, it's been loud and clear. We've heard that, yeah. that need because, because of the increase and because a lot of students with, with ASD don't necessarily need pull-out services. Right. Exactly. We're seeing a lot more in the general education class. But actually, before we leave yeah. that topic, sorry. That's okay. um, just to be clear, is there a way, like what is the right language when we're talking to parents or, and what is the mechanism by which they would request like these MTSS or RTI services that are pre-IEP? It depends on the district. Okay. Some districts have it in place, some don't. We're, we're working to hopefully get 60% of all of our districts within four years up and okay. running with some type of services like this. Okay. Some do a very good job already. Um, yeah. Rockford's got a really good RTI program. I mean, it's very well run. It's not, now, it's really reading focused. It's, it doesn't have all the other components to it, but any type of those, those pre-interventions, I would say almost every district is doing something now. Right. How well it's done varies from okay. district. Okay, but we could, we, so we can suggest something like a pre-interventional approach, and, and that's a language that... You could ask and see if they have yeah. to. You, you can, they can't do it without having the structure right. and the okay. training. So, okay. you know, if they you have know, it, I they'd know that they first to see, do you have something like this? Okay. But, you know, most teachers are going to say yes, and it's going to look different from A to Z, depending on where you are. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are working with Kentwood next year. They're one of our partners. Cool. So... Yes. If there's a change in a child's um, environment or learning, I can't remember the word. Like if they were getting homebound services yep. and they were going to make a change to um, like services on site in a residential classroom yep. or services to Lincoln or wherever, yep. should there be an IEP meeting in place to make that change? Typically, yes. What Does law mean? say it has to be there? No, but we recommend it in Kent County. So the law says you don't have also, you can use the amendment process for a lot of things, but we don't do that. So, what, what <laughs> so the answer to your question is yes. There should be an IEP team meeting for a change in programming because that's a change. And if in there's program. not, you don't really agree. Should we contact you or who? Well, you really don't have the rights the to guardian. the guardian. When could, we say yes. we, I mean yes. us, the guardian. Yes. The guardian so could very yes, very well contact me, or um, and I can recommend them to. I mean, I can give them advocates' names. I can I can tell them their rights if they would like that. I okay. can, I'm not going to tell them anything different than I would tell any, any educator. It's, it's, it's yeah. public knowledge. These are your rights as a parent. You have these rights. So, okay. um, yeah, they can contact me. I am the parent contact. I can tell you I have 12 jobs, but one of them is parent <laughs> It's good so, to know. I didn't, I didn't know that. Because sometimes we'll try to go through the school district, you know, in the system we're working within, and the parent doesn't even get very far. So it's helpful to know that there's, you know. No, again, it's the district's responsibility to make that offer. They, they have that, they hold that card. They, the this offer is, for what? Offer of faith, offer of program. Oh. Yep, that's the district's offer to the parent. The parent then subsequently has rights on that.
come back under that. Then they can work with an advocate. Now, if they're if they're questioning something prior to the IEP, they can get an advocate to join them at the IEP also. So there's a lot of things they can do after the fact. There's free mediation, there's due process complaints, there's due process yeah, hearings. Mean, they'll, the change that I'm kind of alluding to will okay. happen and there will be no IEP, I guarantee you. I, I, hear, I almost guarantee unless you. It's it's written written pre, unless it's written in, I'd have to look at the IEP. Okay. It could be feasible that, that, that is, they're still providing similar services. They could do what's called an attachment of an IAES, which is an um, interim alternative educational setting. I would have to look at, I have to take that on an individualized basis. I can right. tell you whether or not it needs change yeah. or not. Okay. It's not, it's not a, a rule of thumb or a general rule, but there's a lot of different things that can be written. There could be different programs written on different lines that can be serviced during different dates. There could be an IAES form. It could be a removal for certain circumstances that, um, would allow the district to, to provide homebound services without an IEP. Mm -hmm. Especially homebound. That's one that um, can happen if there's a safety concern, uh, mandatory discipline, a lot of different things could, could trigger that. Yeah. How do schools respond to like specific specificity of requests? Like, I mean, like there's some tricky issues. Like the one currently that's in my mind is, you know, it seems like recently kind of a, exaggerate just a little bit. Every parent wants, thinks that their kid needs an iPad in school as an accommodation, you know. And I'm sure that the, the school could buy 3,000 of them, but it's probably not realistic. Probably not needed in a lot of cases. What we do, we have what's called a set process. Um, and they go through and determine the needs based on a number of different criteria. Okay. Um, uh, typically runs through our assistive technology uh, person at the ISD, her name is Kindy Segovia. Okay. But if you have questions about those things, she'd be the one to answer those. But there's a process that she takes districts through with the parents and say, let's let's look and see if it's going to be beneficial or not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's detrimental. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. Sometimes it's detrimental. You get kids on, you know, they get these iPads or fancy gadgets in school and they're messing around playing Minecraft instead of focusing on what they're supposed to be doing. So it doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. Sometimes it's a it's a must. We have we've made such great progress with the technology for like visually impaired students and hearing impaired students and different things like that. Now those kind of students definitely benefit from some of that technology. Um, there's a thing now where we used to, I mean literally a high school level braille book, okay, braille book, uh, a, a textbook, a paper book can cost twenty five to thirty thousand dollars for one book. Okay, we can buy this. Thing now that you plug into an iPad that has an attachment to it that has little dots in it that pop up and down so they can read and then when they get done they read the next page and they get done and it's minimal cost compared to twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. So you say you know it might cost more than no, sometimes it costs less to have the technology than it right. does in the old way we used to do things. Because those books in Braille are outrageous. Twenty five thousand dollars and there's volumes and volumes of them. Or they used to have these big print books, and they carry them around with them. Well, they're huge letters on huge pages. Well, think how much content they can get in, in one of those. So, yeah, it's not effective. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, it, it's this big on a bookshelf somewhere, and this tall, and they have to pull out one at a time to carry around with them if they're originally impaired. So a lot of that stuff that can be done now using technology is much mm -hmm. more beneficial for them. Yeah? What if a kid is in a more restrictive Parent, guardian, school district, your child could uh, potentially perform in a less restrictive environment. Mm -hmm. um, what's the process for that? Well, I mean, first thing you just talk to the district and just say, you know, what you what we consider. The second thing would be parents can request a new IEP. They have the right to do so. And that's where that decision is made. They should voice their concern to the district that they think that this is not the appropriate placement. They can request a new IEP. Now, the district, again, is probably going to at that point really gather a lot of data. And, and determine whether or not it's, it's valid or not, and then present their offer of faith to the parent. Again, now, after the fact, they still have due process rights if they continue to disagree. But, you know, here's the thing about that too. I keep saying they have due process rights. It, 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 it really builds a barrier <laughs> when, when it gets to that level. And there's only really usually one person that gets harmed from it, and it's the student. So if they can work it out um, agreeably, Prior to doing something like that, that's the best case scenario. Because it does build barriers. 